me um, just share uh, with you um, uh, uh, some research that I saw this past week. It comes from uh, Tom Rayner's group, um, and it's uh, regarding church health. It says um, that among the church, uh, in other words, those who attend church regularly, 40% either agree or strongly agree that the church is largely irrelevant. Let me say that again. Among the church, those who regularly attend church, or at least say they do, 40% either agree or strongly agree that the church is largely irrelevant. Now let me give you the second statistic. Among the unchurched, those who don't go to church, only 27% of them either agree or strongly agree that the church is largely irrelevant. Did you catch that? People outside of the church see it as more relevant than people inside of the church. This tells us that the unchurched are more receptive to the gospel and to the power of God in their lives and to the influence of the church and the impact of the church than we understand. And so we must be the church. I dream of a church where people from all generations gather together to worship God with all of their hearts, all of their minds, all of their souls, and all of their strength. A church that is not preoccupied by the style of music, by the instruments on the stage, or the choir on the stage, or hymns, or contemporary songs. Because they understand that they are not the audience of worship. But rather the instruments of worship. And the audience is God Himself. Dream of a church where prayer is priority. And the scripture is the sole source of authority in our lives where people will gather together to stand on God's Word and fall on their knees in prayer. A church where people will gather together in small groups to study the Scriptures, to live out all of the one another's that are in that Scripture. They will love one another They will bear one another's burdens. They will pray for one another. They will confess sin to one another. They will forgive one another. And as iron sharpens iron, so they will sharpen one another. As we together build up and encourage one another. Dream of a church where people understand that we have been gifted by the very giver of the universe, God Himself. And we have been brought together, each of us, to play our part in a bigger picture, something that is bigger than ourselves, something that is the hope of the world, the church itself in which the living God dwells and moves and lives and breathes and seeks and saves the lost. Dream of a church where people understand that it's not about my comfort or my pleasure but rather it's about the cross and it's about pleasing the one true God 
by serving one another. As we exercise the gifts that He's given us, our time, our talent, and our treasure in serving His church, where people are greeting people as they walk onto or drive onto the parking lot with smiles on their faces and a warm handshake that tells people, God loves you. Where we're meeting people in the midst of their brokenness and messiness of their lives and ushering them in to the family of God where they can find healing and wholeness and redemption and joy and peace and love and God's grace and God's presence. Dream of a church that we understand we're here to serve one another. We're here to rock babies and pray over them in the nursery. We're here to teach God's Word to our children and our teenagers and one another. We're here to serve in the great room and help people find their way to Bible study classes and to the worship center and to meet people's needs. We're here to utilize all that God has given us to bless this world We are blessed to be a blessing. We are to carry the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. That God is no longer holding men's sins, men accountable for their sins in Christ Jesus, but forgiving them of their sins in Him. That they can find redemption and life everlasting. Dream of a church that takes the gospel to the world around us every day in every way that we meet the needs of the hopeless and the homeless the heartbroken not only their physical needs but their spiritual needs By being the presence of God and bringing, ushering in His Spirit into our neighborhood. And so today, I want to share with you six key ingredients to bringing God into our neighborhood hood as we live in hood well some of us live in hood are y'all in hood county out there in lipan okay good so into the neighborhood because after all it is for the gospel and for the hood we're going to take a look at exodus chapters 35 through 40 i realize that's a long part of scripture We're going to skim through most of it. And in that, we're going to see those six keys to bringing God here to the hood. Now, in Exodus 25 through 40, the last half of Exodus, we see that God prescribed for the people of Israel what the tabernacle, the place where he is to dwell, his presence will dwell with them. He prescribes for them detail upon detail upon detail of what the tabernacle is to be like, how they are to build it, and what they are to do with it. And then from 35 through 40, we see that they're doing it. They're actually building the tabernacle and dedicating it. And then in 40, chapter 40, we see where God dwells in that tabernacle. So the first key to ushering God into the hood 
is that we do out of our being. We must be before we do. Exodus chapter 35, verses 1 through 3, Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, These are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a day of Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So right before we get to where the people begin to give to the Lord and to serve and build His church, His tabernacle, where He dwells, we catch these three verses that are instructions from the Lord about keeping the Sabbath. Why in the world would God put these in the midst of prescribing what the tabernacle was to be and in detail and then doing it in detail? Why would he put these three verses right here in the middle of it, right before they get to all of the work? Because we are to be before we do. We are to do out of our being with God. We must rest in Him before we can bring anything to Him. We must receive from Him before we can work for Him. We must be before we do. Verse 3, do not light even a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath. That is odd, isn't it? Why would he put that in there? Well, verse 3 indicates to us that the people of God were not even to seek their own comfort above their being in God. In other words, they were to be preoccupied with God and not with themselves or their own activity, or their own comfort, but to be consumed with God. Until we are fully engaged in the Word of God, we cannot fully engage in the mission of God. Until we, the people of God, are fully consumed with the Spirit of God, our world will not taste of the reality of God. The first priority of the people of God is to perch our lives in the presence and person of God. We must be before we do. The problem with the church today is we try to do and ask God to bless it rather than be with God and wait upon Him in His Spirit until He stirs our heart to go and do it. That brings us to the second point. Batteries are not included. You say, where in the world did you get that from? I'm looking around. Um... I remember early on in parenting, it was a night before a special day, and I had to assemble a riding toy that made noise. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I procrastinate. Any procrastinators out there, thank you that there will be a meeting for us after the service. Prasticators Anonymous. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I get the t- 
toy all put together. And you know those things don't take five minutes. You know, it took hours. And I get it all put together, and it moves, and I'm like, yes. And then I go to push a button, and guess what? Nothing. No lights, no noise, nothing. And I'm thinking to myself, man, they, got, they can ride it, but it's not what it needs to be. And then I look over at the box, and I see the dreaded words, batteries not included. Right? And so I look, and I discover it needs six AA batteries. Highway robbery, right? Six of them. So I... By this time at night, there are no stores open on this special day. So, I look at our drawer, and everybody has one of these drawers in the house. Ours is in the kitchen. That's the catch-all that has batteries in there as well. And I go scrambling through it, and I find two AA batteries. Six minus two is four You guys are good mathematicians. So I am scrambling, what am I going to do? And all of a sudden, I look across the living room floor, and there on the stand beside the couch is the golden scepter. You know, the one with all the buttons on it, right? With numbers that you push. And of course, I remember... Not only do I have that one, but I have the one in the bedroom. And guess how many AA batteries are in each of those? Two. Two plus two is? Man, you guys are bright. And so I don't even think about it. I rip off the back. I I take the two AA's out of each one, put them in the toy, and voila. It works. And so the next day, when the kids were playing on it and having a good time and they would push the button and it would make all of the noise, I was elated. And every time as I was watching the football games that I would have to get up and walk across the room from the couch to push the buttons on the TV to change the channel... I didn't even complain. And you know how hard that is on those special days because you've eaten all of that food and you're stuffed and don't feel like getting up. You are a stuffed turkey on the couch. Why was I so willing to give? Because of who it was for. Because of my affection for them. They didn't even have to do anything for me. They were just my kids. And I sacrificed because they were mine. Exodus chapter 35 verse 20 says, Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, for all its service and for the sacred garments. Listen, 22. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds. And then it goes on to share more and more. The skilled women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun to give to the uh, the tabernacle. Leaders brought precious stones to give to the tabernacle, the men and women and all of Israel, everyone, verse 29, all the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord uh, through Moses had commanded them to do. This is a direct response to chapter 25 verses 1 and 2. Where, where the Lord says to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring to me an offering, and you are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. 
whose, everyone whose heart prompts them to give. That's why the first three verses of 35 are first. We be before we do. Because in our being with God, He stirs our heart to give to Him. And to serve Him. You see, there were no unwilling, reluctant participants here. Everything was given to God, came from hearts that had been made willing by the Spirit of God because they had spent time with God. Nothing stirs us to give like being with God and contemplating and meditating upon Him and His Word, upon His love and His grace that He's given us through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross to reconcile us to Him. You see, it's in our being with God that we recognize that He is an unlimited God and He gives freely to us. You see, it's in being with God that we realize we are blessed to be a blessing. And so they gave because God's Spirit stirred them to give. It was a free will offering. And in their offering, they did not ask how much can I get by with? What's just enough so I feel good? But they gave until the Lord restrained them from giving more. You go, what do you mean? Look at verse 36, I mean chapter 36. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab, and I'm sure I botched those names, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work, they received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. All the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning, so every day. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, look at verse 5, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work of the Lord, the work the Lord had commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the whole camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because what they had already uh, what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. This is how the kingdom of God operates. See, the people of God, the kingdom of God, overflows with generosity. And doesn't ask how much is enough but rather gives out of the overabundance from a willing heart that has been stirred by God Himself and by His character. Picture a marriage that is like that. Where both spouses give and give and give and don't ask how much is enough for me to give to my spouse? How much is just enough to satisfy them so that I'm in their good graces? But rather, they give and give and outgive one another until the other one says, Whoa, 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 too much. I'm overflowing. Imagine a workplace like that. That has employees that give and give and give of their time, of their talents, of their hearts, 
their treasures to make that place into an incredible place of business. In fact, they give so much, at some point the boss has to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Take a break. That's the kingdom of God. That's what it looks like. It looks like a children's ministry or a student ministry that's overflowing with workers because the people in the church have been stirred by the Spirit of God to serve our kids and our teenagers and to teach them the Word of God. In fact, it's overflowing so much that Dylan or Deborah have to look and go, oh, oh, okay. We have more than enough. Some of you need to go serve in music ministry or wherever it may be. See, that's a church that has been with God and so is stirred by God's Spirit to go serve one another and to give and to give and to give. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. I want to challenge us in the few remaining weeks that we have in this fiscal year. We've fallen behind on our giving compared to what we've spent. And there is no doubt that a large portion of why we've fallen behind is due to an insurance bill. Uh, When our insurance company dropped us as well as over half of the churches in Texas um, because they had overcommitted, our insurance bill went from 30000 a year to over 100000 a year. And all of it was due up front. Yeah. The blessing is, for all these years as a church, we've been diligent about giving, about overflowing with generosity, and, and, and diligent about spending and how we've spent it, and being good stewards of our money. And so we had money in what we call um, a rainy day fund or budget excess. And so we were able to take on that. But now the quest is to play catch up, to be good stewards of everything in this fiscal year. And so the challenge is for you to spend time with the Lord And to focus on Him and to pray and to ask, God, what would you you have me to give to help our church catch up? Maybe some of you, we haven't given all year. And, And God says, put me as priority. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's not how much can I get by with to satisfy my wants or my heart, but how much is the Lord calling me to give? And so I want to challenge us to pray about that and to let the Lord stir your spirit to give as He shows you what you are to give. The third thing, key ingredient to bringing God's Spirit and God here to this earth and to be the church that we're called to be is some assembly required. So in Exodus 36, we see that not only did they give of their resources, their treasure, but they gave of their time and their talents as well. The women, they spun uh, uh, garments and, uh, and, and articles that they brought to be uh, draped over uh, the tabernacle. Um, the, the kings, I mean the rulers, sorry, the leaders brought precious stones. The men, the skilled workers gave up their time and their talents to, uh, to work on the temple, uh, the, the um, tabernacle. Um, and so they worked together to make this happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 through I mean, chapter 1 verse 3 says we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labor prompted by love 
and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Your labor of love. Building up God's church, God's sanctuary, we are where God dwells, His temple, is a labor of love. Now, labor means it is doing, doing what is expected of me. But this word that Paul uses when he says labor of love, he means something more than just routine expectations and duties. It is described as something much more demanding than the day-to-day tasks that we carry out. It is work that necessitates intense effort. It is even involving pain. We are to participate in a labor of love. You see, that's why it's important that we be with Him and that out of our being, we do. Because if you just try to do, you're going to burn out. You're going to dry up. You're going to frustrate yourself and all of those around you. But if we do out of our being with the Lord, we tap into a never-ending resource. And so we are to do. Everyone serving somewhere in the church and in our community. You see, that is the dream of the church. We've all been gifted by God's Spirit. They're not your gifts to claim selfishly, but they're gifts of God's Spirit to be stewarded for His glory, to build up His church, to carry out His mission. Church is not for you. We are the church. And we are for God's mission, which is to seek and save that which is lost and to bring glory to God through our worship of Him. And worship is not singing songs, but rather how we live our lives as a thank you offering to Him. And so everyone serving somewhere, in a family, when everyone does a little something, no one person is overwhelmed. And we function much more fully as a family. The fourth thing, what's expected gets inspected. What's expected gets inspected. Um, We see in chapter 39 the Lord's attention to detail in His plan to build His church. He gives direction and, and, and we obey. And He does this so that He does not leave room for our excuses or our laziness or our own interpretation but rather for His direction and commands. Note ten times in chapter 39 of the book of Exodus, the words, and they did it as the Lord commanded Moses. Ten times that expression is given. Verse 1, verse 5, verse 7, verse 21, verse 26, verse 29, verse 31, verse 32, verse 42, and verse 43. After each section of what they did, it says, and they did everything just as the Lord had commanded them through Moses. Look at verse 42 and 43 of that chapter. The Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. And so Moses blessed them. Colossians chapter 3 tells us, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. 
for you serve the Lord Christ. You see, everything we are to do is to be done for God's glory. Not for our own approval or for man's approval. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 gives us a better picture. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. The Lord looks at the heart, and so we must live in obedience to the word and instruction of the Lord. We must stand on the sole authority of the Scriptures. Number five, we're almost done, five and six. Number five, look at the big picture. You know that big picture on the box of what you're trying to put together? Have you ever been trying to put something together and and you're not real sure what the instructions say and so you have to go back to look at the picture on the box to go, oh, okay, that's what it's going to look like to figure out what it is going to look like and how to put it together. We must understand and look at how the whole thing fits together and works together. Every so often we need to stop and to reflect, and to look at the big picture. Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 2, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the first month. Now, you might just skim over that in your reading to get on to the next. Like, okay, let me keep going. That's an important part of the whole passage. It goes back, to chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. And if you recall in chapter 12, that's when the Israelites are being freed from bondage in Egypt. Do you remember the last plague? The angel of death that is to go over and to kill all the firstborn, and the Israelites were to put the lamb's blood on their door, and the angel of death would pass over them, and they were to, to be ready. And it says, and the Lord led them out of Egypt on the first day of the first month of the first year. It was the start. It was the start of a new life. And what God is saying here when he says you're to set up this tabernacle on the first day of the first month of the new year. He's saying, my presence is going to dwell with you. You are a new people. You have been redeemed, and you are my holy nation. And my presence will dwell with you. You are no longer slaves in bondage to sin and death but I will put my Spirit in you as my holy people. And you are mine. And this is a deposit that guarantees what is to come. You see, it's a reflection on what God had done for the Israelites in Egypt. And it's a pointing forward to what God has done through Jesus Christ for all those who place their faith and their trust in Him. And you say, why is that important to get a capture, to get a snapshot of the big picture? Well, I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where I'm laboring for the Lord and it's just overwhelming. And I'm tempted to give up to throw in the white towel, to raise the white flag, and I get frustrated, and I get depressed, and I sulk, and I worry. Anyone? What keeps us going? The big picture. 
the hope. And that's why it's important that every so often we stop and we reflect on the big picture of what God is doing and what God has called us to do. Sixth and final one, the hope of the hood. Look at verses 34 through 38 of chapter 40. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day. Fire was in the cloud by night. In the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. They did not move on their own. I love Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. What an anxious, frantic society we live in. We are hyped up on caffeine and have to go, 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 go. And then we stop and we pray and we ask God to bless it. What a difference it makes when the people of God will remain and abide in the presence of God. Seeking the will of God. And allowing the Spirit Spirit to stir our hearts and then living in obedience to that stirring of God's Spirit and call that He's placed upon us in our lives. Every morning in my time with the Lord, I look over my calendar for that day and I look at all the appointments that I have And I begin to pray for those people by name. And I begin to ask the Lord to bless the time that we'll have together, to bless the meeting, to bless those people, their families, to give me wisdom, and to allow me to hear what the Lord has to say. Every morning I pray, and I ask the Lord, I started this several years ago, I ask the Lord, God, give me ears to hear and eyes to see, that I may see and hear the opportunities you give me today to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world around me. Because you see, we have gotten it mixed up. We live for ourselves and we get caught up in the busyness of this world. That's Satan's ploy to distract us. And you may think the work you're doing here for your business, your company, is worthy. But it pales in comparison to the mission that God has you on as the creator of the universe calls you and indwells you to carry His good news to a broken, lost world. And so we need to be attentive to the Lord and to what He is doing so we can be a part of what He is all about. 
You see, we've come full circle now. Again, be before we do. And that is so hard in our microwave society, isn't it? Where we microwave everything, even if it tastes bad. Because after all, I'm in a hurry to get things done. Oh, I rush and rush until life's no fun. Who was that that sang that? Thank you. We cannot force God to move. We are simply beggars at the gate of His kingdom. Waiting, watching, praying, willing to follow and obey. You know, it's often said that God took the Israelites out of Egypt overnight, but it took 40 years in the desert to take Egypt out of the hearts of the Israelites. I want to close with this story that John Piper shares in his book called Don't Waste Your Life. It comes from an event in his life where he was at a Passion One Day uh, celebration back in 2000. A uh, rally with all these college-age students uh, outdoors, and he shares his story with them. There were two church members of his, one named Ruby Ellison, who was a retired nurse, in her 80s, and one named Laura Edwards, who was a retired doctor in her 80s. Both of the women had given up on the American dream of retirement, and in their retirement they were called to go on mission and be missionaries in Cameroon and to meet the needs of the poor and the broken with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one day while they were over there, their brakes on their car didn't work. And they careened over the cliff and were killed instantly. And John Piper looked out at the audience, the crowd of college-age students, and asked them, is that a tragedy? To which they replied, no. And he said, let me read for you what a tragedy is. And he pulled out this article that he had found in a doctor's office out of Reader's Digest called The American Dream. And he said, he read it, it said, Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot yacht, play softball, and collect seashells. He says, that's the tragedy. Could you imagine when God calls you home, standing before the Holy God, your offering for him is a collection of seashells. And then he read this poem by C.T. Studd. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will truly last. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and God we ask that you would move in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives God we ask that you would grant us with your presence that God you would stir our hearts for affection for you that God we would give of ourselves overflowing not ask how much is enough but but God, rather give and give and give out of the overflow of your blessing upon us. Understanding that, God, we've only got this one life. And what's done for you is what will truly last. 
So Father, may Your kingdom come and may Your will be done in our lives and on this earth as it is in heaven. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.